Good morning and welcome to this digital seminar. My name is Sandra Tuveson. Uh, thank you for joining us this morning in this special time. Uh, back home you are watching us, right now you are 54 persons and hopefully we will get as much as 300 today who have registered. Warm welcome to you all. Hope you are doing okay this special time. Today we are celebrating World Art Day. Since uh, 2020, an official UNESCO Day, uh, this seminar is co-hosted uh, with Free Muse, Swedish National Commission for UNESCO, Konstnärnas Riksorganisation, where I work, and with the Swedish Arts Council. Given what is happening all over the world, we are doing this seminar digital, and I'm so happy that by doing so, we can reach out to many more of you. If you're working from home, being in a quarantine, or wherever you are. Thank you for tuning in. We will today listen to prominent speakers, panelists and musicians during the seminar that will last for almost two hours. We are launching the State of Artistic Freedom Report 2020 from Free Muse. Please stay with us and if you want to interact, comment or send in questions, please do so on Twitter and the hashtag is Artistic Freedom SAF20. Artistic Freedom SAF20. Dr. Srirak Plipat, Free Muse's ex executive director that will be with us later, uh, has said, and I quote, freedom of artistic expression is protected as long as it is, as long as it fits dominating narratives, politically, religiously, and digitally. This report shows that the West is losing its leading positions as human rights and freedom defenders at a fast pace, while the world grows intolerant and violent against non-mainstream views and expressions. And with that word, and he will come back to us later, Dr. Srirak, uh, with that I welcome today's first speaker, Minister for Culture and Democracy in Sweden, Amanda Lind. Welcome, Amanda. Good morning, everyone. Today we are celebrating World Art Day and we are delighted that this year for the first time we are able to celebrate it as an official UNESCO Day. Art and culture are vehicles for creativity, innovation and cultural diversity across the globe. They are fundamental for social cohesion, for knowledge and dialogue among people. And in these very challenging times of the coronavirus pandemic, we all recognize the importance of art and culture when crisis strikes. But at the same time, we also acknowledge the vulnerability of the cultural ecosystem as a whole, and consequently, the threats posed to the status and social rights of artists. And in these trying times, it is more important than ever that we join efforts to strengthen the protection and promotion of open and democratic societies where artists and creators can work under both fair and free conditions. Artistic expression is an essential human right. It is crucial that everyone's cultural rights are respected and protected, including access to a variety of cultural expressions and, of course, the fundamental freedom of expression as an artist. Globally, the space for freedom of expression is under pressure. For cultural practitioners, for journalists, for scientists and others. And it is therefore very important to document and to communicate violations of artistic freedom, this is essential for our understanding of the challenges that we face. Strengthening the status of artists and cultural professionals and their artistic freedom requires strategic policy making and also concrete measures. The work of artists must be valued and their social rights must be secured. 
As Swedish Minister for Culture and Democracy, I'm proud of Sweden's long tradition of working internationally to protect freedom of expression and to promote the importance of a cultural infrastructure. Sweden is a major donor of voluntarily funds to UNESCO and some of our financial support is directed towards artistic freedom, including the particular vulnerability of women in the cultural sector. Sweden is also very pleased to be a donor through SIDA to Free Muse and its important work to document violations of artistic freedom, which we will hear more about later today. The Swedish Arts Council and SIDA has also recently signed an agreement on a program to support initiatives for artistic freedom in developing countries and General Director Kaiser Ravin will tell you more about this shortly. I'm also very pleased to see the creative ways to communicate and interact digitally now when travel is restricted. And by conducting this seminar as a digital event, now we can share these important issues with the global audience. And by these words, I want to wish you a very good day. Thank you. Thank you, Minister Amanda Lind. Uh, we will go directly to Norway to Hilde Klemetsdal. Uh, she's the Director for Human Rights, Democracy and Gender Equality in the Norwegian Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Welcome, Hilde. Good morning. Let me first congratulate Free Muse with yet another important global report on the state of artistic freedom. Thank you also for the opportunity to speak to you today. Under normal circumstances, we would have met in person to discuss this important topic but these are indeed not normal times. For a while, human rights, including the freedom of expression and the freedom of creation has been under pressure worldwide. The space for producing, performing and enjoying culture is shrinking. Unfortunately, this trend is being exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic as leaders in many countries conveniently use the situation as an excuse to tighten the grip on civil society media and artists, and to increase government control at the expense of the separation of powers, rule of law, and respect for basic freedoms and human rights. Cultural and artistic expressions are powerful. Precisely for this reason, artists are at risk of being targeted, manipulated, and controlled by those in power or those in search of power. Against this backdrop, the work of Free Muse is more important than ever. The launch of the report State of Artistic Freedom has for a number of years taken place in a Nordic country. We, the Nordics, produce and consume culture as a natural part of our lives. The past few weeks have demonstrated just how much it means to all of us when many forms of arts and culture have practically been shut down. The Norwegian government's platform underscores the importance of culture. I quote, Arts and culture are expressions that embody the power to build and shape societies. A free and vibrant cultural and civil society is an important prerequisite for an enlightened public debate and for democracy to thrive. Our national policies are firmly grounded in our human rights obligations. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights states, everyone has the right freely to participate in the cultural life of the community to enjoy the arts and to share in scientific advancements and its benefits. It includes two important principles. One, the universal recognition of the importance of culture and two, the universal rights to participate in it. The International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights and the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights as well as UNESCO's six cultural conventions are all important for artistic freedoms. The UN Special Rapporteur in the field of cultural rights, Karima Benoum, has raised the awareness of cultural rights in the UN system and beyond. She has time and again expressed her concern about limited access to cultural rights for women artists and for artists with an LGBTI identity. This is a concern we share. All human rights are interrelated, interdependent and indivisible. Yet we know this is not always being practiced. For instance, the right to everyone's freedom of expression is sometimes held up against the right to freedom of religion or belief. 
The report points to several examples of restrictions on artistic freedom in order to protect religions. However, the right to freedom of religion or belief protects individuals, not ideologies, religions, or traditions. The State of Artistic Freedom report documents that the space for producing, performing, and enjoying culture is indeed shrinking. This is part of a broader global trend with a growth in nationalism and populism and increasing attacks on human rights, including in our own part of the world. This is a challenge that requires political commitment and strong partnerships. We must support a multitude of voices and expressions, and we must support the crucial work done by media organizations and civil society like Free Muse. Without freedom of expression, there is no democracy. Freedom of expression is the foundation on which all other democratic freedoms rest. Civil society organizations and partners like Free Muse and others that work to document the actual status of artistic freedom and to improve the conditions for cultural rights around the world are key partners. Norway commends Free Muse for tirelessly working for the awareness of artists' rights. I look forward to listening to the presentations and discussions today. Thank you. Thank you ever so much, Hilde Klemetsdal. We will go directly to another um, thing, and that's the musician Jenny Abrahamsson. Uh, Jenny is covering up for uh, icon musician Arya Aramiyad, who unfortunately has gone ill. Uh, he's, he's good, but he's, uh, he's a bit ill. And they have recorded uh, music together lately. So it was a great opportunity to invite Jenny instead of Aria today. And now we will take uh, part of Jenny's music. Please enjoy. Welcome, Jenny.
Hello there, my name is Jenny Abrahamsson and I'm a Swedish uh, artist and songwriter and musician and I'm coming to you here from my studio. Um, you were supposed to hear Arya Aram Nehad today but unfortunately Arya is sick. He is an Iranian singer, fantastic singer, who is now part of the ICON project, the International Cities of Refuge, here in Stockholm. In 2013, I was introduced to a project called uh, Silent Music Sessions. And the concept is that people like me play songs by people who are silenced in their home countries, who aren't allowed to play their music for various reasons. So the idea is to perform their music and make sure that people hear it and that we talk about it or talk about why they can't perform their music. And me and a couple of artists played songs by Arya Aram Nehad. And Arya was actually there on Link too for, for a bit, then Iran cut it. <laughs> um, and since then me and Arya have been connected on social media. And a bit more than a year ago I saw that he had tagged himself in a photo in Stockholm. And it turned out it had been a secret up until then that he was now part of ICORN, the ICORN project, for which I was very happy. In Iran, Arya has been arrested numerous times and uh, tortured and imprisoned because of his music and his criticism against the regime in Iran. Um, anyway, when asked to step in for him today, I thought, can I, as a pop artist from a Western democracy, I've never had to think twice about what I'm singing or what I want to express. Um, it felt sort of inappropriate to step in and just play you one of my love songs. But I thought I could play you one of Arya's songs. Unfortunately, not in Farsi, but uh, we made a few translations back then. Uh, when we did the silent music session. Uh, and this is one of Arya's, I'd say one of Arya's most important songs. It's called, uh, let me just check this, Baraye Lamse Asadi. Uh, uh, but in English, it's a touch of freedom. And its lyrics is incredibly strong. Uh, it's about dying to get a chance to just express yourself or just touching that freedom um, even if it means uh, they put a bullet in your head um, yeah the lyrics the lyrics really got to me first time I heard them and uh, I'm gonna play you a, a bit of a different version it's not gonna sound like Arias um, but we have recorded an entire debut album with Arya here in Stockholm uh, it's just finished and it's going to be amazing um, and it's going to be out soon. So I hope you get to hear that because he's an amazing singer and artist. Uh, I'm just going to put the camera in a better spot and thank you for having me on Thank you, Jenny. And since this is a last minute production, we threw uh, around the parts. You were supposed to give this intro first and then play the music. Uh, I'm sorry that we made that mistake and I hope you all enjoyed the music. Thank you, Jenny, and thank you, Aria, and keep out for their music in the future. Uh, now we're moving forward to another keynote speaker. Uh, it's Svante Weiler. Uh, he's now head of board at the Swedish Arts Council. Welcome, Svante. Dear viewers, dear listeners, dear participants. In this deeply challenging time, it is especially relevant to acknowledge the importance of art and culture and the subject of today's event, the current state and importance of artistic freedom and what we can do to strengthen it. Artists and cultural organizations all over the world are now going through an extraordinary hard time. The Swedish Arts Council is doing all that we possibly can to counteract the negative effects of the current crisis on the culture sector. We will in short receive a mission from the Swedish government to set up a coronavirus response program for Swedish cultural 
organizations. Once in place, rapid handling will be our highest priority as the needs are urgent. However, I strongly believe that the coronavirus must not stop us from continuing the common work to protect and promote art, culture and artistic freedom, nationally as well as globally. The Free Muse State of Artistic Freedom Report gives us valuable knowledge about the current state of artistic freedom in the world. As we just heard, and as the report clearly shows us, artistic freedom is under threat. Human rights and fundamental freedoms must be respected, also in time of crisis. Unfortunately, the current crisis risks to create an even more vulnerable situation for artists. Freedom of expression is a basic human right and a fundamental part of democratic societies. When, when voices of artists are silenced, democracy is undermined. Strengthening the status of artists and cultural professionals and their artistic freedom also demands concrete policies and measures. Freedom of expression is a central part of Swedish cultural policy. The Swedish Arts Council also has a specific mission from the Swedish government to promote the role of culture for freedom of speech and democratization in international contexts, as well as creating synergies between cultural policy and international development cooperation. We are therefore glad that we, in the beginning of March this year, signed a cooperation agreement with SIDA, the Swedish International Development Cooperation Agency, for a new support program aiming to further protect and promote artistic freedom globally. Organizations based in different countries around the world that are working to protect and promote artistic freedom will be able to apply to participate in the program. More information will hopefully be available before the summer. The Swedish Arts Council also has a specific mission to promote cities of refuge for artists at risk here in Sweden. More than 70 cities have joined ICORN, the International Cities of Refuge Network, to promote the values of freedom of expression and host prosecuted artists. As of today, there are 25 ICORN cities of refuge in Sweden. The strong engagement of local and regional authorities is of utmost importance by offering refuge for artists that do not have the possibility to exercise their artistic freedom in their own country. We must work together on global level to strengthen artistic freedom and the respect of human rights and fundamental freedoms so that artists, no matter where in the world they live, have the possibility to express themselves freely. International cooperation and solidarity are crucial, now maybe more than ever. Rich countries like Sweden must take a decisive lead in that work. Thank you. Thank you, Svante. Uh, we're moving forward to uh, the second part in this seminar, and now we're going to talk about the, the report that we are basing the seminar on. Uh, the State of Artistic Freedom Report 2020, produced by Free Muse annually. And it's just been um, finalized. And we are uh, meeting Dr. Srirek Plipat, the executive director of Free Muse. And he's going to tell us all about the report. Welcome, Dr. Srirek Plipat. Uh, thank you, Sandra. And good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Sirak Pufat. I'm uh, Executive Director of Freemuse. Uh, welcome to the launch of uh, Freemuse State of Artistic Freedom Report 2020. Um, we uh, produced this report, basically a uh, documentation of violation of artistic freedom in 2019. And uh, last year was a year of a lot of change happening. One of the dominant uh, scene and that has really uh, set the tone for 
uh, political climate for artistic freedom has been the growth of um, nationalism, whether it's the Christian nationalism in Brazil or Hindu nationalism in India, where the new president and prime minister took the office, or elsewhere around the country, or say in Europe, when uh, where 14 uh, countries have now uh, have nationalistic uh, politics gaining more seats in the parliaments. And this actually set the scene uh, for uh, artistic freedom and how the result that come out of this growth in particular. Um, it's also interesting to put into perspective um, artistic freedom or when we use a longer term freedom of artistic expression as a human rights. But when you look at um, a few dilemmas going through artistic freedom has been, one of them is among freedom of expression circles itself. Artistic freedom tend to be seen as a subset at a smaller players and actors or smaller agenda item when you compare to media freedoms or protection of journalists. And this is where um, a challenge seems to be lying uh, among protection of, of uh, artistic freedom. Um, the good news is though the UN Special Rapporteurs on Freedom of Expression is likely to produce a report on freedom of expression um, but focusing on artistic freedom when the new report is expected to come out in June, um, possibly to be linked with academic freedom also, which is also uh, an important element of freedom of expression as well as cultural rights. Um, we also welcome recent uh, Finnish governments who call on UNESCO um, to do more to ensure that artistic freedom is included when their actions taken on media freedom. And that is to say, every time we talked about media freedoms, we already include artistic freedom in it. We just have to be mindful and make it explicit. And the key word here is to be explicit about artistic freedom. Every time we talk about freedom of expression, it's already in there, included in the law, and also it should be in practice. The second dilemma around artistic freedom has been around the arts and culture circles. Uh, the recent report by the UN Special Rapporteurs on Cultural Rights has highlighted some of these challenges also. Um, many, uh, often, uh, artistic freedom is seen also as too much on the left or too much human rights by art and culture circles. And this is another dilemma when you see sometimes it's become too small, too hard and too hot uh, and so on. So that's been a challenge. Uh, also, when it comes to integration of artistic freedom in support of arts and culture program, which seems to be lacking. If you take, for example, Creative Europe, the one of the largest grants provided to arts and culture, there's no such thing to protect artistic freedom as part of the criteria, even though artistic freedom is the foundations of all of arts and culture production. Um, but the lack of explicit support in this front at this at the very alarming level. The third dilemma around um, women's rights movements, especially those working on gender equality. Um, the focus has been very much on the eco economic and social um, uh, equality of women's rights and very little or few works has been done um, around uh, the area of freedom of expression of women's artists and women in general. Um, we are proud to be one of very few who contribute by publishing a report on women and artistic freedom two years ago. And we will continue to follow up and see how women's rights has been illegitimately restricted in the digital world, so some of the follow-up. So with this backdrop of some of the challenges why artist freedom remain a small uh, uh, circle in a way that has find it's a bit harder to get into the mainstream discourses. What we do uh, to actually address some of the challenge is to publish a report like what we are launching today. Um, and this is a product where we evaluate um, uh, roughly about 1,500 cases worldwide. Um, some of them we can verify and some of them we cannot. And we put only the one that we could verify and check sources. And as a result, we can analyze 711 cases from uh, 93 countries. 
which provide the basis of this report. While the figure is very low, 700 cases, um, in the world where we believe there's many, um, at least a few thousands of violations of artistic freedom, these figures is sufficient for us um, to identify some global trends of what we actually could see uh, moving forward also. And here's a summary of the report. Very first one, we've seen a widespread of attacks on artistic freedom, um, over 93 countries. Um, it's a, a sad year, giving nine artists were killed in eight countries, and this is quite unusual. Normally we only see one or two artists being killed, and this certainly has been a violent year for artistic freedom. The number of 71 artists in prison in 16 countries, that's the highest we've ever seen artists in prison in any calendar year. Last year it was 60, and this uh, actually show an alarming trend um, that's being used against artists. Detention and prosecution remain widespread also in many countries. Um, moving along, um, we also see um, attacks in various art forms. Um, what did not surprise us has been musicians continue to be the one who got hit the hardest, with about a third of violations were targeted on musicians in uh, almost 60 countries. Uh, visual arts and films has also come second, and that's quite a similar pattern that we've seen in the previous year, and so were theatre and literature. Um, moving to, along to the next one, um, we've seen, uh, looking a little bit closer in, in, in the figures of 71 artists being put in prison. Uh, leading the field has been Spain, and this is mainly uh, rappers who were sentenced for imprisoned, uh, mainly for freely expressing themselves um, through music. Um, and they were charged based on, um, mainly for glorifying terrorism or and insulting uh, Spanish royal family. And similarly with um, Iran, Turkey, the figures has been quite similar to the previous years. Uh, Myanmar just came to the radar screen last year and the number of eight artists being put in prison was mainly the theater uh, groups that um, perform their uh, work uh, questioning, criticizing the Myanmar government on various policy issues and they do it peacefully and artistically through their theatre work and as a result they were prosecuted and put in prison. Um, looking at the rationale for uh, imprisonment, we will see that um, the, um, the main rationale has been for criticising governments and on the second point a very alarming situation has been also the counter-terrorism and this has been slightly going up to 21% compared to last year, stay at 18%. Um, the rest of the rationale or the uh, charges against artists has been quite similar to the previous year, religion uh, related or indecency. And that's basically mean when the artists perform their work, their artwork, but being seen as um, indecent or not acceptable by social values. And then 4% has been on the, when artists get caught between conflict between uh, at least two countries onwards. So that's basically censorship or other way of restricting artistic freedom um, because of the change on the law. Um, moving forward, looking at the um, imprisonment of artists by region, this is um, a surprise. We've seen that Europe has performed rather poorly in the past few few years at least. Um, but this year it's become a bit more explicit that uh, Europe has been um, on the spotlight and um, become number one region that put artists in prison, followed by the Middle East, Asia and Africa. Um, looking at one of the main challenge that we've seen a uh, worsening situation is the use of anti-terrorism measures and laws um, against artists uh, to express when uh, they express themselves and we believe that there's at least eight countries that have misused these anti-terrorism measures against its own citizen including artists bangladesh colombia uh, egypt russia 
Spain, Turkey, the US and Yemen. Uh, some of those that we have looked into the case in particular, and we feel quite confident that this is the case that um, that's been a misuse. And we will look into how we can actually address this particular issue. A closer look into how anti-terrorism measures being used. It's interesting to point out that 69% um, of um, the charges has targeted musicians in particular. Um, this is something relatively new. We haven't seen such figures like this before. And secondly, it's very important to point out that half of this use of anti-terrorism measures against artists have been targeted on minority or artists with minority background, and that stands at 52%. And uh, this is a clear disproportionate use of this charge against artists. And that makes anti-terrorism um, measures become a second most um, rational for imprisonment of artists. Um, the next major causes of restriction uh, limitation of artistic freedom has been religion and this has been a classical reason for restriction for a number of years now and it's good to remind us all that the UN special rapporteurs on freedom of, uh, on the right to religion and belief has also pointed out that um, we cannot use hurting religious feelings as a reason for restricting freedom of expression, including artistic freedom. And the main point here is that between two human rights, um, there is no need for one have to come up or be being realized at the cost of the other. Um, all human rights are interrelated and can actually be realized without having to sacrifice or pick and choose. And either or is not an issue. Um, with that in mind, when we actually look at reality, it's turned out to be not quite the case. Where we see 42% of attacks based on religious motivated has been happening in Iran, Lebanon and India combined. And that's roughly 40% of attacks on artists. Um, sadly, one artist were killed for religious or protecting religion reasons. And that's also lead to quite significant number of 10 artists being imprisoned in uh, Egypt, Iran, Moravia, uh, Malawi and Saudi Arabia and other forms of attacks uh, we continue to see a very similar trends as we move forward. Women artists has been a target and continue to be suffering quietly most of the time um, not being addressed uh, in um, usual platforms and the reasons has been quite similar they are often being charged on the ground of being indecent and a quarter of those uh, rationale has been on religion. Government has account for more than half of um, violation of artistic freedom of women artists in particular. And this happening in the Middle East, um, that's about 40%. And secondly, followed by Europe, that's about 20%. Um, this remain a challenge and we will continue to uh, do the work to make sure that women have also um, be able to use a right to be created um, in the art world, which very often is seen as the male dominant world. Um, last year, we produced a report on how women's right to express themselves in the digital world has been limited. Um, not only to have limited access um, to be able to show their work, but also face um, sexual harassment, especially when it comes to online expression to the level that's significantly more than men uh, artists. LGBTI um, artists also remain a target, and this has also been the case of a growing target um, as nationalism grow around the world. Um, we compare the figures um, between countries that have laws that criminalize and countries without the law that criminalize. And the result has been that there's no safe place for LGBTI artists whether you operate and work in country with or without law that criminalize homosexuality, you are subject and could be target for attacks and other forms of harassment. 65% uh, of violations happen in country without laws that criminalize homosexuality, while 35% in the other half um, of the list. 
we also see almost half of the um, of the attack happening in US, UK and Russia. Um, this is quite a surprise for us also. And about half of the attack actually happened by um, the uh, governments. Minority artists, I mentioned a little bit earlier, uh, one of um, a point worth highlight is that now 84% of attacks of minority artists happen in the global north. And this is a significant increase compared to in the past. The figures stay at about 60 and 40%, meaning 60 in the global north and 40% in the global south. Um, so this show a substantial shift in terms of what actually happened to minority artists. And a third of the attacks of minority artists are now related to terrorism related. As we mentioned earlier on the use, misuse of anti-terrorism measures. And two country worth um, having a closer look as we continue in this 2020 is that two thirds of the attacks on minority artists happen to be in the US and Turkey combined. And half of this attack has been targeted on musicians in particular. Um, censorship happens in digital space as now internet become a part of modern life. Um, most of us now have um, used and do the work, especially artists on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, or YouTube, uh, depends on what um, art forms you are working on. And this um, has been a challenge for many artists and it's worth highlight some of these issues that uh, as we discuss further. And the main one has been um, the most of the social media company use what is called community guidelines or community standards. Um, anything that doesn't fit these guidelines and standard will be taken down. And so the fact of this become a criteria for censorship um, on digital space. Um, our, our major concern has been this guideline has been developed in a very arbitrary nature and does not comply with international human rights standards. Um, so we work with a number of UN experts and calling on social media company to amend and revise their community standards to make sure that when they deal with freedom of expression, they have to use international human rights standards, not arbitrarily company standards and then affect millions of people about what they can and cannot say online. A second concern we have is when content are being taken down, especially on the ground of indecency and being political, it has been extremely difficult. And many artists that we interview have expressed uh, frustration as when content take down, it affect their livelihoods. Many of them has put their Facebook page, for example, um, to show their work and also uh, get income um, as part of that process. Um, this has been very difficult to appeal. Um, it's been uh, confusing also at time when artists reported who you're going to contact and when to get response, when you're going to get uh, the result of the appeal. So this is where we ask for uh, the social media company to strengthen on this part. And then finally, we also call for social media company to publish how many content taking down they have done at the end of the year and what's the rationale for that. And it's important to be able to be transparent about the content takedown and be subject to scrutiny by social, um, by um, society also, as this has been a part. Um, the bottom line and the key principle remain that company also have human rights responsibilities, even though mostly human rights apply to uh, state mainly, but also company do have human rights responsibilities. So that's one of the area that we would like to move this forward. Um, a quick look at censorship um, worldwide. We document 800, uh, over, over 800 cases. Uh, we list the top six countries uh, ranging from China, or if you like to make it a bit easier, they are the, the P5 of the UN Security Council members, except for Iran, actually um, has remained on the top five, um, top six, sorry. Um, but it's also important to point out that the scale of the punishment of the censorship has been quite different. It certainly has been harsher in Iran 
and when artists may lose license or being sentenced or imprisoned in some cases. Uh, the rationale for censorship remained um, because the artwork has been seen as political or being indecent and a similar other rationale has been listed such as religious or LGBTI related. Um, so some other, um, this is quite similar to what we've seen in the previous year. Um, so that's basically will sum up some of the highlights of um, our report and I'll be happy to discuss and answer questions as we move along to the next session. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Sirek. We will talk later on uh, after the panel discussion that will uh, start uh, in a short while. Uh, so please uh, send in questions as well for Dr. Sirek on Artistic Freedom SAF20, the hashtag on Twitter. You can send in questions there. Uh, moving on, just uh, a keynote as well before the panel discussion. And now we move to uh, Switzerland. Uh, to Geraldine Soiner, the Swiss Agency for Development and Cooperation. Uh, welcome, Geraldine. Hello, everyone. Uh, good morning. My name is Geraldine Soiner. I'm from the Swiss Agency for Development and Cooperation. I'm responsible for culture and development. I'd like to greet you and I'd like to thank you as well for this opportunity to speak to you. I was actually invited by Free Muse because uh, there was a conference that we helped organizing uh, in February in Zurich called Art at Risk. I was asked to just say a few words about this conference and also how it relates to the report that is going to be launched uh, today. So the state of artistic freedom uh, is actually going to show us all kinds of different information on artistic freedom, but artistic freedom is more than just the freedom of creation. Of course, it's a freedom of expression, expression of opinion, expression of different perspectives, diversity of perspectives, but it's also the freedom of participating in social processes and also envisioning the future. So it's extremely important to safeguard this, uh, this freedom. But at the same time, artists who would like to live this freedom, they're also extremely vulnerable. And uh, we can think about this, what actually makes them so particularly vulnerable. And I'd like to share with you that a human rights activist once told me, actually to safeguard their security, it's crucial for them to always only bring forward information that they can state uh, that, that they can actually cite from somewhere. All the information that these human rights activists are bringing forward, they can show where this has been published before. And this is the main difference to artists. Artists actually don't do that. They produce and they create content from within themselves. There is a very personal expression to artistic uh, expression and artistic freedom that actually makes them vulnerable because of this personal element. We actually wanted to explore further and understand what situation artists are in, especially in fragile and conflict uh, situations. And that is why we partnered with a small NGO in Switzerland called Artist Foundation and also with the Zurich University of the Arts uh, to organize this conference, Art at Risk. The conference actually had three objectives. First, to understand what the state of risk is for the artists in different situations. And you will probably hear it further on today in the launch that the risk comes from several sources, not only governments, it's not only censorship, but it's also in societies where there's a lack of tolerance from different, different kinds. And the second objective to the conference was actually to see um, what the potential is of art and culture in conflict and fragile contexts. Because the power of the artists, and that's why they're actually in risk, also has very potential features for the future. It brings in some normality after a conflict. It also helps shaping social cohesion and to rebuild a society or, as someone also put it, to remind us that we are human. 
The third objective was to see how we can actually support artists in these situations. Because in order to be free in creation, of course, it's good not to be at risk, but also you need other things like funding, like safe spaces, like infrastructure or opportunities for travel. So actually, if we look at all of these uh, objectives, we have a very overarching purpose that we also pursued with this conference. And this purpose is shared with Free Muse by launching the reports every year. And this is to draw attention, to draw attention to the risk that artists are facing every day and also to call for action. Because a lack of attention can also be traduced, uh, translated into indifference. And that also can be very detrimental to the state of the artists. And uh, so the the report that is going to be launch, launched today is actually a help for everyone not to look away. Thank you very much and have a very good meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Geraldine. Thank you for joining us. Now we're moving on to the uh, next uh, discussion and we're going to have a panel discussion with four participants. Uh, we will talk upon uh, the, the program, um, the report as well, and we will uh, start with two questions that I've asked each participant to think about, so they will introduce some two or three minutes uh, talking upon the theme. And uh, the theme that we have uh, pointed out is uh, how do we relate to the impact of authoritarian uh, nationalist governments on the state of artistic freedom and as well good practices initiatives to strength strengthen artistic freedom tools to support uh, the freedom of artists in the shrinking of the civil society spaces and the responses uh, i will present the panel first and then i will uh, give the word word uh, we have together with us today uh, Sara Edström, uh, artist and chair of Konstnärernas Riksorganisation. And that's uh, an organization working in Sweden with social and economical and legal advices to uh, professional um, visual artists. Uh, welcome, Sara. Thank you. <laughs> so, ni so nice to see you all. Yeah, uh, the technology is working great. Uh, I will get back to you just in a few seconds. Uh, we have as well with us Staffan Smedby, Head of Unit for Democracy and Human Rights at SIDA in Sweden. Warmly welcome to you as well, Staffan. Thank you, Sandra. And the technology is working there as well. Great. Uh, we have Brittis Edman from Amnesty International with us as well. You're uh, Head of Policy uh, at the Swedish Division of Amnesty International. Welcome, Brittis. Thank you so much. It's working as well. Great. Thank you. And uh, last but not least, uh, we have Nora Albadri. Uh, you're a visual artist, a media artist uh, based in Berlin. Warmly welcome. Can't hear you, Nora? No, not yet. Yeah, it's coming. Ah. Thank now you it's so working. much. Uh, looking Thank forward. <laughs> and Dr. Srirak Flipat, you're with us as well. Uh, but you will not be uh, taking part in this discussion so much. Uh, we will save the Q&A for later on. Uh, I give the world to uh, the world. I give the world to you, Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I do thank that you as so well. <laughs> I give the word to you. Thank you so much, and I'm I'm uh, really happy to see all of you and to, to listen to to uh, the summary of the report of the status of the artist artistic freedom. I think I represent uh, uh, visual artists in Sweden. We organize uh, about three thousand five hundred visual artists in Sweden, and we have been for for a long time. Uh, discussing this thing of artistic freedom in the Swedish perspective. So I think it's very vital that we zoom out and see it from, from this global perspective as we do today. 
because I think uh, in Sweden, when we try to talk about this as try to learn from, from uh, the, the things that are going on in other countries, sometimes we are met with the attitude that we are talking about, like just these small issues, because if you see the perspectives, mm -hmm. one can think that what's happening in Sweden is just like little small things that, that can be easily um, explained as, as just something small. So I, I always try to, to compare it with, I think, the, the very uh, successful uh, metaphor of the pyramid of violence that was talked about a lot in the Me Too movement that all these little things combined enables the, 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 the most violent things that are going on in the, the top of the pyramid. And so you have to address all these little questions at, this, at the same time in order not to, to push forward like the, the boundaries of what we see as uh, acceptable. Or... So I think that is a very important perspective in this, that we have to address all these little things. Like in the Swedish perspective, it could, it could be um, this uh, local politician that is taking down a painting from the city hall because it doesn't fit his or her personal taste, not even for political reasons, but just... And then we always go in and comment and, and try to, to correct. And uh, we have to, to, to fight the... The, those kind of rhetorics that say that this is just a, a too small fight and it's almost also like seen as as uh, being uh, disrespectful for artists that are really under risk but i think it we that that is what we have to do to to stay firm uh, to stand up for the beliefs that we have and i think also now, in, in these times when we are talking about uh, what is going on with the corona, we have to be really, really careful to, to, to also withhold the, the ground that we stand and not let politicians use the, this crisis to, uh, to shift these, uh, these uh, boundaries that we have and in, implement more strict uh, rules that we see is happening in, in countries around us. And, uh, we have to be like we have to find much more much more allies around us so that we are not just talking about the art scene or the cultural scene as something very small as we have uh, heard uh, today talked about that this is a, a much larger uh, issue that has to do with all human fundamental rights and for that i think we really need to to have more allies in other sectors of politics and 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 also in in uh, societies in general and maybe one positive thing of of the corona crisis is also this that people actually really really feel the lack of culture when you cannot access it as you are used to so maybe that can help us strengthen our 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 team <laughs> Thank you, Sarah. I don't, Do you want to stop there? Well, I, I don't know how this is going to be. Like, uh, are we going to talk to each other or am I? <laughs> I'm, I'm going around now. I'm coming back. You're yes, coming, coming back. Out. And I'm thinking about that when you come back, you get to comment on the others as well. So please yes, save any you. comments that you have. Uh, and I give the floor to uh, Stefan Smedby from SIDA. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Sandra, and thanks for having me here on this panel. I'm, I'm very happy to be here, uh, especially on the launch of the, of the report on the state of artistic freedom, since Free Muse is one of our partners uh, at CEDA. And for us, I think that the, the, the issue of artistic freedom is extremely important because it is an essential part of something that is very central to Swedish development cooperation, namely the broad area of democracy and human rights, and within that, the freedom of expression. Uh, I would say that this is really at the heart of, of, of development cooperation. Uh, the, the, it's by far the, this 
largest sectors that we're working in, the broad sector of democracy and human rights. I think it's over 25% of CEDAS funding that goes to that area. And within that, I think that what we're doing within artistic freedom is, ex is extremely important. We have, at my unit, we're working with the global strategy uh, with democracy, human rights, and the rule of law. And then we have at CEDA a number of other strategies at country level, regionally, and other thematic stra strategies that, to varying extents, also work within these er er issues. But I would say that our strategy is the one which has the clearest entry points, perhaps, to, to working with these issues. <coughs> and we have a, a portfolio of, of, of different partnerships and, and programs uh, that are related in one way or another to the area of artistic freedom. Uh, Free Muse is one of them, and we're very happy to be, to be uh, a partner of Free Muses. Another one which is interesting and very exciting for us is what was mentioned uh, previously this morning by Minister Lin, but also Svante Vailer, a new uh, program that we have just agreed with the Swedish Arts Council, which is a way uh, of working together between CEDA um, as the Development Cooperation Agency and the Swedish Arts Council with their expertise and, and knowledge and experience. And that's a way for us to, to expand and improve our work within this area of, of artistic freedom. It's, it's, these are very early days in terms of this new program, but we are very excited about it and look forward to working on that in, in, in the coming years. But when we, we also need, we have another set of, of relations and, and partnerships. I, I would like to mention the broad program that we have with UNESCO around... Um, cultural diversity, communications, media and statistics. That's a bit of a backbone of our portfolio, I would say, on, on culture and, and artistic freedom. And we also work with partners such as ICORN and, and PAN International and others uh, who have perhaps another uh, uh, focus on, on, on special groups and, and individuals even uh, giving that kind of support. What we are trying to do is to combine, I would say, support at the global level to the global normative framework um, around issues such as freedom of expression and artistic freedom, together with initiatives and programs that make sure that these global policies and normative frameworks actually are translated into, the, into realities in different countries around the world. So mm. we need to bridge that gap between the sort of normative work that is being done and what is actually taking place uh, on the ground in different contexts. And I think that what Sridak just mentioned presenting the report, I mean, that, that uh, testifies to the need to continue working on these issues. And, and, and sadly enough, I think that we, as we witness what is going on right now, as we speak with the ongoing corona epidemic or pandemic, uh, I think there are risks, there are clear, uh, evident risks that that situation is, will be used as a pretext or an excuse for uh, dismantling or, or, or undermining uh, important uh, principles around <coughs> democracy and human rights. And so, so I think that, I mean, the, the fact that we're facing a, a, an enormous challenge in terms of the, of, of the pandemic doesn't mean that we need to shift focus away from these issues. On the contrary, I think mm. it's really important that we stay focused mm. and that we do our work uh, continuing uh, working with these issues. Great. Thank you, Stefan. I will get back to you um, uh, touching upon these questions later on as well. Thank you. Uh, Britis, I will give the floor to you. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, and thank you for organizing this event. It's really, uh, in many respects, very refreshing to be here in my uh, actually quite boring home office uh, <laughs> to meet all of you and, and hear what Free Muse has to say in, in the new annual report. I think... Um, what is happening, not only because of uh, authoritarian nationalist governments, we're sort of seeing a shift uh, where information, access to information, um, expression and so on is, is uh, in many respects a new front line for where politics meet, where conflict is taking place. And I think we used to say in, in the human rights circles that a yardstick of a country's human rights performance 
has long been how it treats its prisoners. And I think increasingly, perhaps we're seeing that the yardstick is how it deals with views it considers bad or dis distasteful or disfavored. Um, the, the push of the authoritarian governments uh, towards tough measures, we're hearing what impact that has on uh, on uh, voices and opinions that aren't tolerated. And uh, we're also seeing how they use and abuse uh, legislation and criminal justice system. Um, and uh, uh, we also heard Stefan mentioning the, the pretexts, uh, pretexts of national security and counterterrorism um and and even um at amnesty we've already uh, documented uh, how the corona pandemic is is being used as uh, as pretexts um so that's one one of the uh, great areas where we see this negative impact another one is of course how uh, these governments uh, increasingly demonize and and undermine the institutions that uh, with their independence and their functions should be uh, protecting the right to freedom of expression and other rights. Um, and of course, artistic expression takes a huge toll here, uh, both at the individual level, uh, where for an individual artist to be vilified by a government or prosecuted uh, is, is, of course, uh, extremely serious, but also for the sphere, the mm -hmm. artistic sphere. Uh, but I wanted to also mention something which is uh, perhaps slightly, um, the, or I would say it's the flip side, as the, the space for debate and political view within the political system is shrinking, uh, what we're seeing is a sharp increase in protests young diverse groups come together in mass demonstrations we've seen that across the world uh, where they seek to shape their societies um, and it happens in more spontaneous ways often mobilized through the internet and and uh, popping up where it's needed artistic expression i would say is seminal um, in these in, in that flip side uh, or on that um, that reaction uh, both in mobilizing masses and voicing uh, public calls for action. Uh, one of the, uh, a third impact from authoritarian uh, governments, I think is actually shaping global trends. I, I think, uh, I mean, what Sarah was saying that the small increments, uh, steps taken in the wrong direction here, uh, is really important to, to keep an eye on. They are part of shaping global trends towards tough measures, towards legislating away problems, uh, legislating to silent the, silence the voices we don't tolerate or that we uh, want to discredit. Um, and uh, there's also within the, the, devel uh, the, the democratic world increasing uh, criticism uh, against the human rights framework and human rights, international human rights institutions. And I, I think that trend is something we need to, uh, to take seriously. Maybe I'll stop there and I get back to other points later on. Thank you so much, uh, Bittis. Uh, I'm so looking forward, Nora, to listening to you talking from the artist perspective. Um, the question is double. I mean, as an artist, you're not responsible for dealing with, with these questions. Other kinds of infrastructures uh, is needed to, to help artists and uh, shape um, safe spaces. But uh, in a way, I'm so curious as well to listening to your thoughts. Please, Nora. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, I mean, it's a broad topic in a way, and it is in a, in a way, uh, to me, it is very personal and very practical, but also uh, I think we as artists are personally always invested in shaping the world we live in. That also means shaping the rules we 
kind of want to see. Let's mm. put it that way. We don't yeah. want to obey. And uh, so I heard many already interesting thoughts uh, on, on most of those levels. So I will share a little bit of anecdotal stories, which I think might be representing some experiences of artists here in Germany. Uh, as well as some of my reflections on that topic, which is something I think which is very close and deep uh, to me, uh, dear to me, because, you know, I have also worked in countries like Egypt, uh, where I have personally experienced more freedom of expression in that time uh, than I sometimes experience in Germany. So mm. this is a very important point for me to make because uh, my practice is also decolonial and decolonial does mean actually to criticize your own government, which is apparently, as your report not really surprisingly uh, said, also the main reason for uh, harassing and, uh, and uh, shutting down artists is if, when they criticize their own government. And uh, I mean, I'm not surprised that music visual arts are in the front line of all of this because our practices are in a way, they're not just a critique, which uh, is um, one step for me. And uh, I think we have, we see so many artistic practices where art is a way of truth making. I find this is a very beautiful term, but for me personally, I like to see art more to create uh, emancipatory spaces and narratives, which of course are challenging, like the really, in a way, difficult situations we are uh, facing now, which uh, probably are much better than like uh, many years before maybe, or in other times, but still um, the topics uh, I heard from you and I feel are in the moment very important here from a European perspective mm. and I'm half, I'm half Iraqi so um, all I do in a way is I try to recenter the, that we don't believe that the world is uh, shaped around the global north and all kind of that things this is um, just the frame when I talk now this is the European perspective but what I can see here the main problems for artistic freedom are, of course, nationalism, conservatism and things like institutional racism. And I think the first speaker also said it, it's uh, and sometimes it has very subtle, subtle forms, but they add up and they become really uh, severe and uh, real um, limits for artists, which end in persecution, but which also end in more subtle ways of silencing the artists when you think about funding streams, for example, like who are the juries? And uh, so now two anecdotal stories. One is a negative and one is a positive one here from Germany because I've um, experienced both of it. Um, and um, so, for example, there, there were certain projects which um, I was prepared that they are not going to be funded because they were too political, too critical. So one of my most popular projects actually is called the Nefertiti Hack. Uh, it was a kind of um, emancipatory intervention into a large museum here in Berlin where they have a bust of Nefertiti from Egypt. And uh, I kind of stole the data, but data you cannot really steal and put it online on a public domain for the cultural good, uh, for the common good. Um, so this was not funded, uh, of course, uh, in a way as expected, but then we as artists, we also find different ways. And uh, I, I just want to say this because this is the reality we are dealing with. Sometimes we write two proposals for one project and they can be really different. And uh, in this case, um, I will also name one funding institution, which in the beginning was, of course, not really happy. It was the German Goethe Institute, like CEDA, I guess. Um, but then when they saw the resonance of our artwork and it was like viral and it was greeted, of course, more in the global south than in the global north, but uh, also in the global north, people Asked, uh, started to understand what, what was that all about in a way. Um, so I think everyone was happy except maybe for the museum directors here, <laughs> in that, that specific uh, museum. And this leads me also to, and even the Goethe Institute was, oh, that's a great project. And why didn't you write it that explicitly in your proposal? And I was like, I don't think, and I know you would not have been in the position to fund it. So we kind of also protected you from taking um, responsibility because we showed it in Egypt and this were more, let's say, political difficult times in a way. <laughs> 
And the, the positive story I wanted to share is um, that very recently um, I also got another, like I got denied after this project basically all public funding in Germany, which is a, is a kind for me of censorship um, because uh, our, like how artistic work is funded in uh, Europe and Germany at least, it's mostly by public funding and it's like a big club and uh, this is the reality. It's also nepotism uh, as part of, I think, uh, censorship and part of the, that actual freedom. If you question that systems uh, that feed you in a way, uh, that's a problem. And also, um, so recently I got a lot of funding from, for example, Switzerland, uh, from UK, because being the prophet in your own country, criticizing your own government, that's really not a good thing, but I think, it is. Uh, it can be part, an existential part of uh, many artists' practice uh, in an everyday, on an everyday basis. And I think we need that spaces. And it's not just a critique, but it is just, you know, also proposing new narratives. But then, um, yeah, another maybe thing I would like to mention because I am talking here from Germany and Berlin is something what was also mentioned in your report that recently we have that. Uh, trend towards uh, the far right and we have seen the that party afd for example in some um, state parliaments and they are of course um, um, the first ones who are uh, trying to shut off uh, cultural fundings uh, even like um, certain institutions like uh, independent theaters uh, and uh, they said something, and I'll just uh, quote it um, to see that mindset, uh, what we are dealing with here, uh, what, what they said about colonialism, that, and, and I'm quoting, colonialism was a sign that the white race was superior also in terms of civilizations, and that these, or other, these other races saved a lot of blood and sweat thanks to colonization. This is what they said last year uh, in uh, Baden-Württemberg in the parliament. Uh, and oh, sorry, Nora, we're... can I just ask you, who, who were the person saying this? Uh, wait, this was the parliamentarian, what's that? One second, I have it here. Politician in the parliament? Uh, uh, yes, exactly. Okay. Uh, in Baden-Württemberg last year, and I don't know, wait, one second, Udo Stein was that. Yes. Okay. So, Nora, I would like yeah. to uh, bridge over to, thank you so much. I would like to bridge over to Sarah. Uh, I know that you at Konstnernas Riksorganisation have been working a lot as well with the question of uh, arm length uh, regarding artistic freedom, uh, uh, given funding and artistic freedom and so on. Uh, would you like to um, say something upon this or comment on the others as well? Well, yes, I think, I think as we all uh, talk about today, that this is a very complex uh, question that that includes like all, like we say, all the different human rights. And as uh, when we talk about arm lengths, uh, the principle of the arm lengths, uh, I don't know what it's called in English. Politicians should stay away from what the artists are doing. And we have, I think we have in Sweden and many other countries, we have been a little bit too comfortable with uh, that things are going fine and, and we have like a good government, they're doing fine things. So people are not used to, to standing up to fight for, for this principle. So when it occurs, it, it, it's, uh, it's like we are a bit surprised that, oh, what happened here? So I think it, that, like I said before, that we have to react to all these little things that are happening just to, to stand up for this principle, because because it uh, it is so uh, connected to, to freedom of expression as a whole and and uh, and the building of a democratic society, of course. So I think uh, like uh, that is very good that that we are talking about it in a in a global perspective and to hear other artists in countries that we kind of uh, thought were were not like that so it's very mm. surprising as you say in the report to see that that europe is really rising in in these uh, negative figures and i think that has to do a lot with that we have been uh, like a bit too uh, comfortable and believing that everything will sort itself out and we just go about our business and we don't have to to take this fight but um maybe um, 
uh, we see the development in Sweden uh, with the, the rise of nationalist uh, parties and this kind of populist rhetorics and that it's very easy to win uh, people's uh, votes uh, with a very simple rhetoric of, of us against them and, and, and to, to have this uh, division of society um, to so, so we see we see the examples in Sweden that we we have to learn from, and we learn much better to also hear examples like, like from have a, it's easy to get I also want to say it's very important that we um, that we work together with our, our organization, uh, the world, but it's also very. Uh, illustrates our the economic situation that we are all in artists are in under so much pressure in just a normal uh, situation and now of course with the corona so much much more we are always the that, that uh, have a weak uh, basis to stand on to stand up uh, and speak our rights because we we want this commission work, so we, if if someone tells us to maybe chip it to fit, maybe we do that because we need we need uh, to survive as artists as well. So we are always like very, uh, we have conditions economically, which makes us also weaker as organizations and weaker. As, we are all you know we're all time and money. So, so money to actually work together with other organizations. Well, Sarah, uh, the internet uh, is a bit hacking so many, with you. So many okay. Let's take. Let's just take a pause with you and get back to you. Uh, okay. Thank you. Uh, very good yeah, points okay. regarding the economic situation, given um, safe and uh, how do you say? Um, um, Nordia, curious. No, you're a brave, Courageous. brave artist. When you're economi ec economically safe, you could be braver as well as an artist. Uh, Stefan, I wanted to um, reach out to you uh, and see what have you been thinking about when you listen to the others? And is there something that um, we can learn from each other or that you miss in these questions? No, I think that we have a lot in, in common in how we view the situation. And I think someone described it as it, it, is a, it is a complex issue. And I think that the complexity is, I mean, there is a variety as to how this plays out uh, in, towards different groups and individuals. Uh, and there is a variety to, to how uh, problems occur and, and also the fact that this occurs, it's a worldwide phenomenon and it occurs in different contexts. So that I think I'm, I'm a bit humble to that because I think it's, 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 I, I, there's probably no one size fits all solution to this or one mm. prescription method that can, we can always apply. Uh, so, but on the other hand, I don't think that we should reinvent the wheel. There are things that work and, and from our experience, we know that we can work at different levels. We can work with different initiatives and different approaches that mm together and combined in a smart way in different contexts can make a difference. And just to mention a few of those, I, I think that just information, knowledge, data and facts is extremely important uh, in this context. Uh, the report that was launched today, I think, is part of that. Uh, the work that I mentioned previously on, on normative policy frameworks uh, and, and to sort of strengthening and backing them up is, is also extremely important. Uh, and in addition to that, I think the simple way, the simple work of what we do a lot within development cooperation of, of building capacities of actors and organizations that work uh, really hands on with these issues is extremely important. I mean, as someone said here, uh, being financially backed up gives, mm. you, gives you the possibility to stepping forward and, and being mm. courageous. Mm. And we often see that, that cultural actors and, and artists are are at the forefront and, and pushing the boundaries of democracy and the freedom of expression. So backing up and, and, and 
these, these um, actors in organizations is extremely important. And finally, I would say that, I mean, especially in these times uh, where the, the, the uh, current situation with the corona crisis, it illustrates very well <coughs> something that I think that we have seen in, in development cooperation and, and in an increasingly complex world that we need to be very flexible. We need to be adaptive to a world that constantly changes. We cannot stick to our plans and budgets and, and just you know, implement them as, as we once thought would be the best way. We need to constantly engage in dialogue and discussions with our partners. And we as donors, as funders, I think that we have a responsibility to really respond to that need for flexibility and, and adapt that, uh, adaptation that is really needed in this, in this um, in this situation and again the corona crisis i think very much illustrates that need so mm -hmm. so i think that we have to work on that from our donor perspective we need to be very flexible and to be <coughs> very uh, very supportive of our partners and the difficult situations that they they find themselves in we know that our partners are very much looking into this they are doing their analysis they are coming up with ideas and ways of changing and adapting to the situation and and again, as funders, we need to, to respond to that, I think. Thank you very much, Stefan. When we, when we spoke before, we talked about how important it is to meet up with people physically as well, to get information And in the corona situation now. That really points out how, uh, how if this situation is going, if it's going to stay like this for a long time, we will lack information that would get to us otherwise. Uh, previously years I worked as an advisor to the Minister of Culture in Sweden some years ago and I traveled the world and I met with NGOs in different countries in uh, Lesotho and South Africa and Montenegro and Russia meeting with uh, artists and journalists uh, being threatened and that knowledge has given me the backbone of so much information that I wouldn't have uh, to give forward to organizations and funding organizations and so on. So the physical meeting is so important as well, uh, as you pointed out, Stefan, before, in our conversation before. Uh, Brittis, I would like to reach out to your comments on this. Um, well, I think, I mean, it has been mentioned, I think the uh, what uh, Free Muse has done to to lay bare what's going on and and to to document and report uh, is hugely important. I think for for democratic governments, for international and national organisations, to take that shared responsibility to ring alarm bells uh, when need be, and to voice concerns over measures, over draft legislation. Uh, to speak out and I think um, we sometimes get a sense that is it really worth it and and I think it, mm. it really is we need to uh, we need to be part of forming opinions uh, as we see opinion is is shifting we need to shed light on violations and and speak out against abuses that's really central but at the same time, naming and shaming uh, doesn't go all the way. Uh, there is a need um, to support the positive, uh, support mm. countries, support organizations that seek to improve, uh, say, respect and um, protection uh, for artistic freedom. Um, and I think there is, for all of us, a need to, to consider how we can build and be part of big creative coalitions um, mobilize broadly uh, and doing so also discuss uh, in earnest what societies we want to be part of shaping, um, mm. what human rights do to our societies, why is freedom of expression uh, so sacred, why, why is it so important. I, I don't hear so much of that earnest conversation and I think there's um, time here. Why is here that do you think to with this? I think that, um, you know, the, the, I would say that the rhetoric is quite simplified, but we actually, um, countering that, I think we need to move away from simplification and bring in nuance. We need to uh, bring in um, 
much more um, much more um, long discussions. We need to be part of of uh, um, shaping opinions together, uh, not just throw out uh, short um, quotes or be part of a, a very polarized narrative. Uh, we need to, to inform ourselves and and uh, be part of, of a, a longer discussion. Nora, regarding to the post-colonial post uh, rhetoric and discourse that you are working in, what are your thoughts uh, upon the report that you haven't read, of course, uh, it's uh, launched today, but the, the discussions um, we are taking today, do you want to add something from, from your perspective? Mm, um, yeah, thank you for the question. I'll try. I mean, uh, certainly when I looked at the report, it's like a global report. So you see the so-called global north and global south and start, uh, I immediately start comparing it. And for me, nothing of the report was so much uh, of a surprise, but I think in the collective consciousness, probably some perspectives are just plainly like uh, wrong, maybe that no one would think that in, in Germany or somewhere in other European countries that artists actually are facing such challenges mm -hmm. because it is a little bit of a, uh, yeah, it is not uh, enough probably debated as my, you just said uh, earlier. And uh, maybe we need to start that conversation, also including artists, even though uh, there is maybe an assumption that artists should, you know, come to the world and just express themselves. But no, actually, we have to fight for this almost every day for our space in which we operate. And uh, I think this is also an okay. But uh, in another way, I have to say from my experience that artists also can only fight that much. Uh, and it is a bit yeah. exhaustive when you always have to uh, defend and discuss what you are doing. And when you always have to say, no, no, it's not meant that political. No, it's actually not a provocation. It's a comment on a pro provocation. <laughs> so, but it's not a provocation itself. And all these kind of ridiculous uh, things, which are part of that uh, more complex story, which is true, I think uh, the same uh, the same part it would be a solution to have a more deeper uh, conversation about it, but also with artists, mm -hmm. I think, because we are experiencing this every day. And uh, from the post-colonial perspective, I would like to add one positive, very like um, practical example, which I experienced, which really worked well. And uh, usually like the constellation of juries, which are the, in the middle of deciding who gets the funding, for example, the juries are a very precious uh, instrument and body in that whole process. Mm -hmm. And if the juries are diverse, uh, like truly diverse, and if they are rotating and changing, then you get fantastic results. And uh, that I have to mention this is a little bit uh, showing that I don't think um, that this is uh, actually done uh, as much. So with projects which are dealing maybe with, you know, more migration uh, uh, biographies or realities, only those people in the juries are going to understand what that actually means. Uh, and only they will be the ones who are actually supporting it. So you need to invite, a, invite more exactly. people into the yes. juries and yeah. so on. I Without think that we have to... View. Sorry yes. for interrupting you, Nora. Uh, I just wanted to give uh, one minute to Sarah and then we're f uh, f uh, summing up the panel discussion and uh, then I want to move forward to Dr. Srirak. But Sarah, since you were hacking a bit there, uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, do you I just want I, to give some enough. reflections uh, from what do you need as an artist? You're representing an artist organization, but what do you need more? Well, I think it's, it's very important what you're also talking about, Nora, that, that artists cannot be the ones that, that carry the, this whole burden on their shoulders because of, uh, like, for many reasons, but also for, for economic reasons, mm. that we are, we are, uh, I, it's, it's not maybe uh, suitable to say, but sometimes it feels like a, a weak voice because of that, because because we, we need to be stronger economically and be backed uh, by our uh, governments, uh, of 
workforce and societies to be able to function and do what we want. And then there, there can be other people in the art scene that speaks for us. And then, so we can do our job as, as artists. So I think, I think talking about money is very, very important. Yeah. And uh, to be, and also, like I said, to, to also have the time to, to do everything. As artists, we, are, we, we have to do the art, but we also do all these other things and fight for our rights and fight for both uh, freedom of expression, but also for our economic rights. And I think it's sometimes just uh, too draining and, and it's uh, horrible to say, but even just like for, for an, uh, Swedish artists, maybe it's also disrespectful to say because we are actually doing quite well if you see the global perspective mm -hmm. but but still that also maybe gives a perspective that even even in a country like sweden that's very wealthy and we have democracy even there it is difficult for artists to to be able to express themselves freely for a lot of reasons and right now and I, you're waiting for the funding from the government post corona situation regarding the artists that uh, has lacked, uh, that's yes. uh, been missing out of all of their income. So I yes, know that's I think, something uh, that you work a lot with. We are, we are, I'm also based in, in Berlin right now. So my artist friends here, of course, uh, I have seen them uh, get this uh, Corona funding much quicker than is happening in Sweden. And I think uh, maybe it's very difficult for, for people to understand that it is such a super, uh, it's, it's a very, very, it's a question of time, you know, you cannot, you cannot be with too, totally without income for, for this long. You have to re really speed it up. And I hope that's going to happen in Sweden as well. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, Sara Edström, uh, chair uh, at the Konstnärernas Riksorganisation. Staffan Smedby, thank you very much from SIDA. Brittis Edman, thank you so much from Amnesty International. And uh, Norel Badri, thank you uh, from Berlin, artist. Uh, keep on the good work. I'm now going to uh, change for a discussion with Dr. Srirak. Uh, Srirak, can you see me? Yes. Can yeah, see me good. Hi again. Thank you so much so. for giving us the report. Uh, as we have heard, the statistical information that you are giving all of these organizations and individuals are so important to back them up in their daily work. So again, thank you for fighting to proceed with this report. Uh, I was so intrigued to listen to your presentation as well. Do you have a first comment on the panel discussion? Otherwise, I have some other questions, but I just want to listen in if you have some questions and comments. Um, maybe a bit of a follow-up comment. I think yes. um, maybe just make a few uh, points following up. And I think most of this has been touched upon by the panelists already. Okay, but um, please do, please do. Yes. Well, after you've seen the report like this, certainly the questions will come up would be normally be so what can we do <clears throat> that we present the picture of problems what what are some of the solutions that we can realistically do and i think there's at least three ways of what we can actually do um so first one is certainly to get uh, what stefan mentioned as a normative policy framework in the ngo world we certainly call that advocacy work so we yeah. try to influence policy um, level um, from the international regional we work quite a bit with the EU trying to uh, address some of the policy framework to make sure that artistic freedom is more explicitly included in some of the European uh, policy related to cultures as well as on human rights. Mm -hmm. So it's really important to get the message right from the very beginning to address this. And, and we make very good progress now with the European Parliament, for example, the LIBE mm -hmm. committee the culture committee started to include some of the texts on artistic freedom since we launched a european report or this report yes. with a focus on europe in particular in the european parliament two months ago yeah i read that. so that's a change at the broader uh, policy framework and secondly this is about human rights and human rights is about individual lives it's important for us to highlight some of the victims that we've seen so they are not only numbers in our report um, each life of the individual artist does matter. And this is show the importance of really campaign for their lives. Uh, if they are imprisoned, 
um, any call for the release or support them when they are prosecuted or some human humanitarian support when that needs to. So that really come down to touch upon individual lives of artists. It's just so critical for us to work. And that solution is the campaigning part. Mm. So we invite our partners and Sarah mentioned a few times on the needs to, to work in partnership with like-minded organizations to campaign for individual artists at risk, which is so central to this process. Mm. And then thirdly, the overall broader of how we need to work together between organizations. Um, at Free Meals Now, we started the Global Action Network for Artistic Freedom to include individuals, organizations, as well as artist network. Um, to look at how they can respond to this challenge together in the uh, creative way, in an artistic way. Mm. So we are facilitating artist networks. We know artists are not very good at getting together compared to other uh, constituency. But the need to build constituency around artistic freedom is, is long overdue. If you look at other uh, sectors, in social change uh, landscape, you will see journalists got together much better. They organize better, they influence better, they campaign better. Similar with women's rights organization, they're always strong. They have network in the parliament and they can advocate for their causes. Artists are not necessarily strong in that. So uh, this is where we are helping coming in and facilitate. Uh, I think Stefan mentioned about building capacity of organizations. So this is very point. Um, somewhat the art specific um, organizations such as musician unions, um, performance groups and so on get together and work a bit more in the union type. So calling for economic mainly support uh, as well as other aspects certainly for that particular types of arts. Um, but we are also trying to bring these different art groups whether theater groups uh, musicians, filmmakers and other visual arts to really come together and really campaign for um, a structural change so that there's been improvement of the enabling environment. So those will be some of the comments I would put on and say this is some of the few steps we can actually do. We can also be a part of solution, whether you're individual or you're as an organization. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm thinking about how you compare as well the women uh, rights organizations with journalists and and uh, maybe uh, I think that if the artist were to be uh, actually paid to contribute to these kinds of uh, meetings and so on, they would uh, be uh, uh, have have it easier to to uh, take part of these meetings because they are so financially uh, weakened, it's harder to get them together, I manage. Um, yes. uh, I've got some questions from Twitter uh, for you. Uh, the first one is, how can individuals contribute to defending artistic freedom of expression? Um, individual, you certainly can be a part of um, artistic freedom defenders. Um, you, and this is what Free Meals has started uh, last year where yeah. uh, you can sign up and join us and basically start campaign for individual artists. Um, we basically put together various campaigns and it is also um, as we're scaling up. One is certainly to campaign for individual artists at risk at the moment. So, we so individuals can state. take your uh, material and use it as individuals for yes, campaigning. Yes, can, mm -hmm. can say uh, sign petition and so on. And, and they can find it in, in the report? Um, they can uh, find it on our website, actually, okay. Perfect. And then if you click on the uh, Artistic Freedom Defenders, that will uh, link you to where you can join. I think the important part of individual is that um, they can be a part of campaign community. This is like-minded individuals, people who think art is an important part of being a human. Yeah. And this is where you need to defend artistic freedom, you defend humanity in itself. So it's important to really come and really stand up for the rights of other people. And you actually defend the rights of yourself by doing so and the overall community. Mm -hmm. And it can be also good to join. So you're not alone. There are many um, people like you who care enough to stand up for artistic freedom of others. And this is how you change the world um, one step at a time and one action at a time. 
Thank you. Uh, I'm just going to say we will uh, finalize the program in uh, 10 to 11. So we will uh, keep another five minutes or six minutes running uh, just so you viewers back home know. And uh, I have another question for you. There is an argument that human rights, as we know it, is not a Applica applicable sorry, <laughs> equal around the world. How do we make sure that human rights and freedom of artistic expression are representative for all? I think like most human rights, in my view, um, it's, it's a normative, it's a standard being set and it holds, it's draw up relationship between individual and states. And it is for everyone who have to really stand up and claim those human rights. So it's not necessarily you know, automatically given to you. Um, you have to stand up and claim it. And at time, you might have to fight for it. And you see it in, in our society, in our history. Uh, people in generation before us have to stand up to defend and fight for freedom that we currently enjoy nowadays. And this is basically, it's the fight of people in, uh, in the generation before. And it's important also for us to get into human rights narrative with that mindset, mm. that it is not going to be given to you automatically. Some might happen, but other, you might have to stand up and fight for it. And I think that's a reality as we have seen in so many national contexts uh, throughout our history. This is something that you basically have to, to fight for. Yeah. Thank you. Maybe you've already answered this question, but I will give it anyway. Uh, what would be further steps in highlighting issues from the report? What is the way forward to touch upon the questions? Well, it depends on who you are. I mean, if you're an individual, um, your uh, social network is certainly one way that you can actually spread the words. Um, if you have Facebook or other social network platforms, mm -hmm. I think it's good to share. Um, feel free to get in touch with our staff also and if you'd like to organize a seminar like this at your um, whatever the context you are or the country um, we're happy to support that or provide additional resources materials or be a part of that and really get the debate i think that's what it is mentioned that you don't just throw information at people but also to have meaningful conversation gradually yeah. take the time um, i think it's change time um, so spread the word, start conversation. I think um, Mandela mentioned before, you start the world, you change the world by one dialogue at a time also. Yeah. So it's face a conversation. To face. Yes, yes. Yes. Uh, I have one last question. Uh, is there something that really uh, stood out that you want to uh, highlight for us uh, in the end um, as a really... Um, strong thing that you want us to to uh, listen up to that stands yes. out in the report yeah thank you very much i think as i put it at the at the very beginning um, the world is changing now and we are growing more nationalistic especially the virus pandemic will likely to strengthen that part yes um, when the relationship between between states markets and civil society has changed and swift more to states making calls of what companies and individuals can and cannot do, mm. as we've seen in travel restrictions for good reasons. Um, and in other, there might be some challenges also. So in this context, um, where artistic freedom, freedom of expressions overall is looking to a worsening situation, it's really come down to individual person and organization to really come together. Um, to really push this back to the extent that we can. Um, if you come across any incidents, feel free to share that with Free News so mm -hmm. we can actually look into those particular cases. Mm -hmm. uh, Nora mentioned about funding, for example, and how nationalistic become a criteria in some funding in some countries that you have to promote uh, national and uh, any alternative narratives would be likely to be uh, risk funding or at time being silenced and it's come down to individual person and organization to take action so that we don't just listen to this and say hmm uh, this is bad news mm -hmm. but what can we do I think individually everyone can be a part of this process uh, as I think the person who asked earlier really addressed the very issue 
it's very important that we take this personally, that we take action. We don't just listen to this information. And that's how we can contribute to positive changes. So the silent majority has to speak out, speak up. Indeed, indeed. Yeah. Yes. Thank you so much for uh, taking initiative to the report and thank you for uh, coming here today talking to us on this digital event. Uh, Dr. Sri Rak thank you thank you and much, take Sri. care. And thank you all the viewers at home. We're ending up, wrapping up. I want to thank, say thank you to my great producers here today. A big uh, hug to you and thank you uh, back home. Take care. See you uh, in the future in different collaborations. Take care. Bye.